What do you know you can't explain? What do you feel? You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Like a slip in the mind. Driving dry hand. It is this feeling that has brought him to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Following, 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 following
So this is Brian Maynard, he's a curator, and he will be the first guest moderator for the Anticone in Conversation. I'll leave him to introduce everyone, and I hope everyone's got their seats. Thank you. Thanks, Shade. Thanks, everyone, for coming to the second takeover at Newington Green with Anticlone. So for some of you who may not know, Anticlone is a gallery, which and also a conceptual sort of gallery that was created by Shade English in memory of her mother, uh, Marcia Byfield. So this is the second takeover that's been going on over a month, and we've had some exhibitions over the first week, and for the rest of the month, we're gonna have a couple of events and some talks. 
Second talk is on the 26th, and we've been blessed to have Joshua's piece behind us, which is the last sort of piece of artwork that we can see. So today, I'm blessed to have the three individuals next to me for the talk. We have Wada next to me. So Wada is an artistic and creative director, and also the artistic director for Ubu Nation. Today, we saw a film um, of Ubu Nation a couple of minutes ago. And then we have Joshua Wolford. Joshua Wolford is a multidisciplinary artist who works in various mediums. Today, we saw one of them, actually two, sorry, three, actually, with the artwork behind. And Joshua recently graduated from the Royal College of Arts. And we also have Othello D'Souza Hartley. Othello is also a multidisciplinary artist who has showed various different types of work in different mediums, and one of them noted as autograph not far from here. So thank you guys for coming on. And I think where I'd like to start is, so the, sorry, before I go ahead, I'd like to just make it clear that the conversations today are around identity, around exploration of self, and the film that WADA blessed us with today from Ubi Nation was quite poignant in that. And I'd like to just sort of put the table out for you. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so, Wagwan. <laughs> so there was um, two pieces here that were shown. Both of them kind of come from a wider project, which is entitled Ruins. Um, the gentleman, for those of you that saw in the video with me, is my creative partner and also co-artistic director of our dance company, Fubu Nation. Um, and we try to work um, across a different mediums, even though we're a dance company, it's quite important to create live work and screen work, and we play with photography and collaborate with different artists of different mediums to kind of do all of that. So Ruins is, um, yeah, it is an exploration of like identity and self. It's really rooted in um, this concept of like masculinity and um, what that even means and our, more so our relationship to that term um, internally and kind of, I think there's a rearing, a system of rearing that kind of leads or fuels this idea of like performance of what masculinity even means to us. And then we sometimes can feel uh, maybe cornered to subscribe to that performance. So I think Ruins is a play on tension of kind of trying to deconstruct those ideas and um, a little bit of an exploration of more, more so what happens internally with that sense of struggle um, as opposed to um, maybe what's more outwardly presented. It's more the exploration of like the internal psyche and struggle of that. No, definitely, and I think that also took me to your film, Josh, um, where the idea was, you can't figure me out. You can try and make it make sense, but this is who I am, and I make sense the way I make sense. And was that the intention exactly of how you sort of wanted to, well, in a smaller picture, but also a larger picture? Um, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I think a lot of... I mean, I guess everyone, but I'll talk for myself. Like, a lot of my experience is based upon how other people see me and perceive me. And I think, um, you know, sometimes it can be good, sometimes it can be bad, or maybe sometimes it can be aligned with how you want to be perceived, and sometimes it won't. Um, and I think the project for me was really about trying to understand, or just kind of like listing out, like, what are the ways people, what are the ways I assume people see me, and what are the ways that I, feel comfortable now recreating those kind of perceptions in front of a camera in my house <laughs> to put online. Um, so kind of like playing with them, like playing with like being sexy, playing with being like half dressed, playing with being, with, with just moving and being physical. Um, but at the same time, asking these questions, like just trying to make the viewer aware that this is probably what they would have seen regardless of if I was moving in the way or not regardless if I would have asked those questions, they would have been thinking about that, they would have been putting these certain ways of seeing me onto me before they even know what's going on inside. So it's really about that relation between like the viewer and the individual. 
Right, no, definitely. And it was very reaffirming for me in many ways and kind of reclaiming space watching that. And that leads me to you, Othello. <laughs> um, I mean, we've, we've discussed your film in depth previously, but the film where you are the subject and you're actually in the, in the underground car park. That's Tell right. us a bit more. So that film was done in 2018. And it was a year there were so many things going on. And being a black male, there was just the same year that Edward Edward became the editor of Vogue. And in that same year, one of that very positive thing happened was that black guy was killed in New York selling cigarettes, who actually broke up a fight. And that's where that thing came of, he can't breathe. And then at the same time um, in South Africa, in Pretoria, black girls are being sent home because their hair was natural. And I think in that particular year, there were so many positive things, but also at the same time, very negative things. And then that was the same year that David Lammy gave the speech about the Windwash generation. And they get that amazing speech in parliament. Um, so then you've got this sort of like moving forward, but also moving back at the same time. And I felt as a black person, there was a lot of like pressure because it's like, you're seeing someone who looks like you in New York, but then, and then you're celebrating someone like Edward Enfield becoming the first um, black editor of Vogue, right. which is a major um, fashion magazine. And then at the same time, you've got David Lamley giving the speech about the Windrush generation who were being, being sent back. And it all came out about how many people were being sent back to their home countries who came and some came with their parents or some came here to work and some came as young kids and been sent back to the countries that they've never been to or, or since they were child, young children. So all these things happen in one particular year. And then I talked to a, lot, to a lot of friends and myself personally about how that impacts on your mental health. So the decision to use yourself as the subject, was that, because I've seen yourself as a subject in your photography as well as in your film. And did you feel like a sense of responsibility or a sense of, because I really, you know, like as yourself, do you really identify with what's going on in society and therefore you want to be the subject or? Well, for that particular piece, it was, wasn't just about, um, yes, it was about how I felt, some things I'm removed from, but even if you try to remove yourself and you can say that it's, it's happening in America, it still has some effect on you because you're watching someone who particularly looks like you and then you see someone who, and then you find that the background behind the story, and we're talking about 2018, but there's a Batman being killed in the streets, and you see them putting, they, they were all on top of him, and there's people saying that he didn't do anything wrong, he was actually stopping the fight. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said to you, you're celebrating this thing that this person now has become the editor of the magazine, and then you're hearing things like in Pretoria, which is South Africa, you're hearing about black girls being sent home because their hair's Afro. So you, you, it's like this. And then you're having these conversations, um, and then there's things that you go through in yourself. So it has sort of a, an effect of you subconsciously, even if you try, you're not living the experience completely. Yeah. But when you see all these things, so it's like this. And then, yeah, as I talked about, it's what to do with mental health, how it affects you mentally, but all, watching all these particular things when it's up and then it's down, it's up and it's down. And it could be you, in a way. This is it, yeah, no, 100%. And in terms of sort of how we explore our own identities as individuals, I know how perhaps I have, whether it's through the work that I've created or who I work with, but can anyone here just sort of elaborate on that and how they have done that independently? Um, sort of exploration, how yourselves have explored your identity, maybe if it's through your work, if it's through different mediums, because for example, a few of you are multidisciplinary artists, is there a particular medium that you have done that through? And actually, how's that made you feel as you've gone through that journey? Um, I think for myself, um, <coughs> my background and a lot of my training has been physical and it was, it's been dance related, but I've, I've always, um, been inspired more to make than do. So I feel like, for me, it always starts from that physical place. Um, it's, it, whatever I do begins with my physicality. And, um, and then from there, I can kind of maybe hone in and then grow and then develop. So even like um, the piece that we're showing today, um, like I mentioned earlier, is a series of, uh, it encompasses a 45 minute 
live show. And this is, what we're showing today is like a, an adaptation of, I guess, just di different fragments of what that 45 minute piece is. Um, and then alongside that, there is um, a series of photography that kind of goes alongside it. So for me, it starts in this very physical place and this is where I develop my ideas and um, where I kind of hone in on the themes that I want to touch on. And then from there, I will kind of question and ask myself, how does this look if we took it and we wanted to adapt it into a, st and a series of still images? And how can we still take those same themes and concepts that we're working on in this very like physical space that is supposed to be shown on stage and experienced live and kind of capture it in a moment, but it still feel like the same thing um, and the same with film. And um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question, but in, in short, yeah, I, I think for me, it always starts in the studio. It starts with my connection to my body and how things feel uh, within me physically. And then from there, I can paint a clearer picture of what I'm trying to say or trying to do. And then I can allow that to kind of grow and translate into different mediums. Yeah. Sorry, so I think in the same way. Um, for me, it's like I'm exploring the performance side of masculinity. So in the first film, which is actually a 20 minute film, where you see the men in front of the camera, then so I've left them in front of the camera and they don't actually, I actually haven't actually told them before they come what the piece is about, what it's about masculinity. And they become this kind of performative, they start to put doing a performance within themselves because it's uncomfortable that it's in front of the camera. So that performance is kind of a bit about my life in, in a way. So I explore my own work. So being a black male growing up and then questions about sexuality, questions about how you, how you, how your appearance, um, how society sees you. And do you fit into what, how society um, views a black male in a very sort of typical, uh, very typical, typical kind of way? And it's how you view yourself. So in doing that, that work was help, helped me to kind of understand myself. So um, yeah, it's a bit of that. Yeah. And it's quite a brave thing, isn't it, to find yourself and then stand true in that and still showcase that to the world, regardless of how the world decides to see you, this is who you are, and this is how you define and show the world, you know? And I think that's the beauty of being an artist. You can explore yourself and deal with issues through your work to understand yourself. Definitely, definitely a brave aspect, I think, that we often see in this case. Josh? Um, yeah, so for me, I think, um, well, in the beginning it was because I was always there, like, I'm always, with me, so I can always use myself to do stuff. Um, so that's kind of what, like that video was in lockdown, so it was like, I, I was just doing it at my housemate, or like then housemate was like recording me, because I was like the only material that I had like around that I could use, and also that's free. <laughs> so that's kind of, that helps. Um, then I think, yeah, I started to get a bit more critical about that with myself, like of only using myself. I think it's, good to not try and represent people that you haven't had the same experiences but I think also like it shouldn't be that our world is only focused on our internal like ideas or struggles without looking outwards and I think it kind of came to light I was doing like a four hours or like two four hours performances at home by Ronan McKenzie in January last year so like this time last year actually and one of them was like me like polishing shoes and the other one was me moisturizing myself and like after four hours you're just like kind of thinking like what am I doing why am I here but and then like, I kind of thought, like I asked myself, like, am I an artist or am I an exhibitionist? And I was like, oh damn, yeah, true. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's going on? So I thought maybe like next time I should try and not use myself. And then for my graduation project, which was like the second video of mine that played with Yo-Yo, who was dancing in like the red light, that was kind of the first time using some, or, like inviting someone else into my process and also having someone else's body being like kind of the end result of what you see. And it was difficult, like I had a lot of questions and issues about me as like perceived male using a female body and directing a female body under patriarchy. I kind of thought like, should a man or who's perceived and gets the privileges of a, of a man like I do, be able to direct a female body or a female identifying body? And um, it was a lot of like quite intense conversations that me and Yo-Yo had like through the process because we developed the piece together. Um, and I think I'm still kind of confused, like where I stand, I think it feels safer to use myself in that sense, like, um, but I think it's important to have those conversations and to also like 
have them publicly as well, even though they're difficult. And I don't really know what's right or wrong in that case. Yeah, and there's a lot to be said about using yourself as the subject, because there's, again, a lot to be said about having a muse as well. And what are we doing there? Are we romanticizing an individual, especially if they are from a different gender and so on? Um, so yeah, I totally hear what you're saying from that perspective. And in terms of yourselves now in your journey of your work, do you find that you have found that identity or you are still in many ways finding your creative style and your creative sense of self apart from your identity individually in the world? Your sense of yourself in your work? Yes. Yeah, I think once you've gone through that journey and you're able to explore these different things, I think you, at some point, you no longer feel like you have to kind of explain mm -hmm. yourself. You just produce the work that you feel that's right to you. And I think I've reached that point when it's the conversations I was having before was trying to kind of understand myself but also understanding myself with other people and how other people viewed you. But now it's um, unapologetic. I'm just doing the work that's true to me. Yeah, um, I think similarly, I think it, it depends for me personally, like uh, a lot of what I do with my craft is not necessarily, how can I say this? It's not necessarily like, um, always gonna be made for me, because like with myself and Reese, who's my creative partner, and what we do with our company is like, it's very much self-driven, and it's like, in that space, I can, I can be unapologetic and feel like I wanna make the work I wanna make, because I wanna make it. Um, but a lot of the work that I do is kind of outside of that, and it's like, choreographically, it's like taking on commissions and working with different people, maybe working with a company, or a group of people that aren't necessarily my chosen collaborators. Um, and that is a different kind of space to navigate because you kind of have to work with what you're given. But a good thing that has come from that is it's um, been a great playground for me to explore my process of making and um, what that looks like for me in the studio and how I can develop my ideas in, cap in collaboration with all of these bodies that I have in the space. And, and that has helped me hone what I then do yeah. with my personal projects a lot more because I've, I've kind of, it allows me to go through these motions of like trial and error. And it might be a bit problematic to say, but I'm less precious when it's like not my own work in that way. It's like I am more willing to try and fail and, um, so I think that has given me like uh, a set of tools that I feel very comfortable kind of starting from. But in terms of like the work that I do with myself, um, I, yeah, I don't really think too much about the perception of, of others or how it's viewed or how it's seen. And I move more from a space of like, it has to feel good for me because if it feels good for me, then I can be convincing to those watching. Um, so I try to s always cultivate something that I feel like I can connect with. Um, for me, I think it depends. Yeah, I think, <laughs> so I used to be like a graphic designer or that was like my creative output. So it was everything digital and like commission based. So it's only really been in the past like three years since I moved back to England and I did my MA that I've been like working with my body as material more and working with physical materials. And I think my, like working on my graduation project um, and I guess the physical exhibitions I did kind of in the run up to that, I kind of got some certain materials and like combinations that I've, I'm like, okay, this is becoming a part of my vocabulary now in like the physical making space. Like this black textile on like black rope, like black textile hanging behind, which is like a continuation of and making it bigger and making it kind of appropriate for a different space, but it's kind of like a thread that's running through. And I think that I'm kind of using, you know, like when I work with ceramics or now I've started doing like sculptures with other, like larger sculptures with different kind of materials and it's still bringing like the dynamism and the kind of tension that I think I try and capture in, in these pieces and also in my performances. So it's kind of, it's like, for me, it's like one thing told, like one story told in different ways. Um, and I think like maybe like 
yeah, it's becoming chapters of the same book. So like at some point it's gonna get probably boring for everyone. But <laughs> for me it's really it's really interesting to figure out like these small details that kind of feel familiar. Um, and also working with different materials, you learn a lot. Like when I was putting that thing up here, like it was so different than at the school because we we're in like a church. And at first when it wasn't attached to the balcony, I just had these like rods underneath and it looked like black like hooded figures sitting in the pews and I was like whoa what the fuck <laughs> so like it's also like you're also constantly learning a lot depending on like what you work with and where you work with it and like every time even if it's the same it's actually it's very different it definitely gives that signature feel I remember when I came in and I was like that's definitely Josh's like <laughs> straight up and um what are you touched a little bit on commissions and working with maybe a brief that's not necessarily your own sort of vision and in, in that sense, have you ever, not just yourself, but anyone here, ever had a brief that has maybe irked them, maybe just itch a little bit in the wrong way in terms of this is not fitting with the way that I would show my work or the way that I see myself? And if so, how have you maneuvered around that? Um, not so much, because I, I do feel like in that context, like um, I am given the license to, oftentimes it's like, come and make whatever you want to make. But what you make is very dependent on who you work with. Um, so what I learned is I might have an idea of what I want to produce, but maybe this is not the right group of people to do it with. And at the end of the day, these are like performers that have to bring this to life. And I'm, I'm not stepping on stage with it, and I am not physically performing it. So. Uh, it put me in this space of like kind of trying to read a room real quick. So like uh, stepping in to a situation and maybe I have a set amount of weeks to make something that's half an hour or something that's an hour. And um, for me, it's kind of like seeing who I have at hand and what their strengths are and, and, and then kind of playing off of the back of that. So I think a lot of it is informed by like, because I mean, you want to make something that you consider yourself as like good and like is stage worthy, but then you also, for me, it's really important to, um, for those taking part in it as well, to also like feel a sense of like ownership over it as well and attachment to it and because then they can do what needs to be done with it, right? So I think a lot of it then becomes about like utilizing what you have in the best way as opposed to, um, forcing an idea that is not working on this set of people because maybe their background is different or like the, the way they move is different and their training is different. And uh, example, if I work with like a company that's maybe a little bit more classically trained and balletic and that's not my space, but it's like, okay, you have um, a facility and a toolbox that I don't have. How can we like try and marry and merge your skill set with my thought processes and and find common ground in that way. Um, but no, I feel like I, do, I rarely, like, I'm given really rigid parameters to work within in that way. I think the only time I have those sort of conversations is when I normally meet curators or um, gallerists, who then, when you're having conversations, and it's about, we spoke about it before, about the black aesthetic and why is your work dark, and then the conversations would be about the culture you come from, did you come from a sort of rich, colourful colour culture? And then it's going over those photos and then trying to understand is why is it, why is your work dark and why don't you add more colours? And if you talk about compromise, I was just talking to a friend of mine there, and like, I did compromise recently for a private commission where it didn't want a black background, but it was a private commission, so I, I did compromise on that. But usually when the compromising comes, it's not compromising, it's just when you meet galleries and they meet you and they're just like, why is your work dark? And then I, I, I had a conversation last year with a, with a curator and this went for an hour and we just wasn't getting anywhere because I was talking about the work. But it was like the references weren't connected to me and then I invited them to the studio and then, and then they began to understand. Yeah. But it was the basis of like, why is your work dark? Why, is you, why do you paint black? Why is everything dark? And they couldn't understand it, but they just, yeah. Those are the times when I feel that I have those kind of conflicts. 
It's that sense of keeping your creative integrity, but then at the same time doing the work in the way that, you know, like it's that 50-50. But I can definitely see the tools that you were discussing, Wada, with, even though you don't come across those instances too much. But that's pretty challenging, I'd mm. say, Othello, in that situation, because that's, that's your work, right? That's but also you've got to think about it commercially as well. If you want to be commercially successful, and it's during a moment where everything is very vibrant, and you hold on to your integrity, and you do you want to continue, and you just do, like I said to you, do the work that means something to you, and you're being true to yourself, even though you're getting this, this conversations about why is it why don't you add more colour into your work? Why isn't your work colourful? And looking into the sort of future of where each of your practices are going, um, and as you see your identity evolving and growing as you go on, do you sort of see your work changing? Do you see it going in a particular direction? Or do you find that you're sort of set? Um I would hope to think that like it's always changing with um, with everything that I do. I think just generally over time, um, for me personally, like my preferences change or move, shift a little bit. Um, the things that I was once maybe taken by or interested in, like couple of years down the line I'm no really longer like struck by and so um, there's always I think there's always sp space to shift and for me it's quite important to be malleable in that way I don't feel like I'm set and um, kind of have my boots on the ground with exactly what I'm doing I feel like I mean the piece that was shown today was created in like originally in like 2019 and then that adaptation of it was shot in 2020 but the research for the whole project began in like 2017 and yeah. I'm like not there anymore. Um, but over those years, just through some of the work that I've been doing, I'm gravitating a little bit more to uh, film work and I feel like that is implementing itself in my practice a little bit more in a way that maybe it didn't before, even with like these uh, examples of like some of my work that was shown today. Um, I would approach that scenario in a very different way now had I like had I gone to film this today or you know like in the now like I would have a, diff a very different process of how I would approach that because I feel like I have had a little bit more experience with how to work with film since then and um, that was very like it was really rogue it was really like um, guerrilla style like we kind of went in with no plan just like we have choreography and there was like there was no shot list there was no like there was no treatment made there was no like sense of like mm -hmm. us kind of having a DOP and then like really refining what we're doing in terms of like a cinematic like aspect and um, I think I'm a little bit more clued up on those things now and um, just through other work that I've done since so I feel like I would approach it a lot more differently and I think because of what I have learned since then my choices would be different and the way I would I would want to engage with creating um, is slightly different. So yeah, I guess the thing that is changing is I'm I am my interest is kind of stepping a little bit more away from my work only being live work to trying to kind of step into more film spaces. Because also when you make a film, it lasts for forever, and like for me to do a show is like taxing, you know. Um, and costly and it's just you know you see it if you're in the room but if you're not in the room then what happens you know yeah. so yeah yeah I think I relate to that last point about like the people outside of the room because I think I mean <laughs> so like the reason that I started doing more like sound stuff originally well I kind of wanted to make a noise like an uncomfortable noise um, and then I used to use, well, I still do actually, like reference like um, songs from like the civil rights era, like a lot of Nina Simone is coming through and like basically everything I write or even like singing like bad version, <laughs> bad cover <laughs> versions. If you've seen like other performances of mine, you would have heard that. <laughs> um, and then I kind of was like, you know, why are we make, why are they, why were they making such um, difficult scenarios um, so easy to digest? Um, and that was the reason I made it uncomfortable because I was like, this is painful for everyone and it should be painful for you too, like feel it. 
And then I kind of started thinking about it, and I was like, actually, do you know what? Like, no one, <laughs> no one's going to download this, and no one's going to listen to it again. Like, the power that music had was, it was beautiful, it was deep, but also people could listen to it again and again and take it with them. So I think, like, learning how to, like, strike a bit more that balance between work that's, like, challenging, but also that um, is going to be spread. Because I think, like, I think at this moment, I have the confidence to say that I, like, the ideas I have and the way I see the world deserve to be shared and to be listened to. Um, so I kind of think that's my goal, but not to lose like the grittiness and not to lose like the DIY and not to lose the idea that you can just go out and just do it without having anything but yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but to definitely like, I think, refining even the mess, like a refined mess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then with like the physical work, I think, um, just like, like to keep doing it. <laughs> Like, it's expensive and you need space, so it's not that easy, really. So, like, I think if I'm able to just keep making stuff, I'll be happy. And I don't really know what it has to look like, but just, like, having the opportunity. Yeah, I think I'm the same. I'm just um, making work and experimenting more different different mediums and just pushing myself to just try things out. Right. So it's much more like a, a playful approach to the work. So going to the studio and not necessarily always having the idea but going in there and then trying things out until you, um, by experimenting and keep working on it until it comes, but not having that, but you have a slight idea, but then a bit more, bit more fluid, a bit more loose, yeah. and then see what the outcome will be, and then trying things out, and some things don't work, but it's just that process of trying it, and then moving it on, then incorporate into the work that I want to make. So I'm thinking much more doing that now. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, um, in particular, Josh, with, in terms of performance work, it's an interesting time right now where people are starting to understand it a little bit more and putting value to it where they didn't beforehand. So I'm hoping that there's opportunities to play around in the stone spaces can occur a little bit more. I'm um, not sure how we're doing with time, but I'd like to put it out to the floor to see any, if anybody has any questions at all. Shadi says, don't be shy. <laughs> I can't see anything here, so somebody let me know if anyone puts their hand up. I think we could. No one wants to talk to us. <laughs> I'd also say open to more collaborations. That's really interesting. People with different mediums. Um, I recently, recently spoke to someone who's a concert pianist. We're going to try and do something together. So I'm really interested in trying to work with people in other mediums and I spoke to somebody else last week as an architect, seeing how we can collaborate in some sort of way and do something. And that sort of thing at the moment. Actually, I have a question, even though I'm not meant to be moderating this one. I hate that question, but it is also always necessary. In regards to now in 2023, which is wild considering, yeah, the year's going by quickly already. We're soon in February. Where do you see yourself in next year? Do you think ahead in terms of where you wish your art to be, or are you simply taking it as time goes by? Because with me, obviously, with Anticone, I always have a plan as to how I wish for things to be by the end of the year, but when it comes to my own work, I just make as I feel. I don't plan or pre-plan that I want this show or that show. I only produce art when I feel something. Do you guys do the same, or? Are you, do you have a plan? And be honest, don't lie. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I have to have a little bit of a plan um, in the sense of uh, like, I'm in the process of like creating a new show and we like did a big stint of R&D for this like a year ago and um, I have to plan a little bit in regards to that, because once you act, once you try to actually actualize it, there's um, it. It kind of grows beyond you, and then you become you. You have a duty to fill, if that makes sense. So like, uh, whereas when I'm developing the ideas that I want to create create material out of, that's when I feel a little bit more free. When it's like there's less pressure because I'm just researching. I'm just finding what it is that I'm trying to say. But once it becomes like, okay, we're making a show now, then there's interest beyond yourself because that show has to be programmed in a theater and there's like 
you have to deliver one hour because that's what you said you're going to do and then there's like a tour in place that's being planned and there's dates that are like gonna come to fruition like a year from today and like maybe in six months from today I will like not be in that place anymore but by that point like you know there's been a commission there's like money involved there's like a team working on it there's um it goes a little bit outside of yourself um and then you have to fulfill that obligation and I think that's the thing with the dance world anyway and performance work it's very like um it can become quite I don't know if long-winded is the right term, but like once, once there's a, um, an agenda in place and like there is a series of venues or um, people that have commissioned the work, it has to go there. And so you have to stick with it and I have to fulfill that obligation. But how do you find a balance between, for instance, I know one of the films that we screened today was filmed in the v &A. How do you find a balance between showcasing your projects versus taking on board industry projects? Because of course, we need money to function, we need money to put into our projects. Yeah. But how do you know when to say no? Um, I think with the, the work that I make through my own company is, is work that I wanted to make. So um, whether like, you know, the, fulfillment of that project stretches over time or not, there's a sense of like um, passion that I have for it and also like achievement because it's like I, it's something that came from nothing because I wanted it to, like I pulled it together and now it's this thing. In terms of if, I, if it's like more industry stuff that's like, like I do a lot of a lot of my bread and butter is like choreography and movement direction and you know working on other people's projects and like I might work with a director or whatever and in that sense it's not my project I'm just like a tool uh, for someone else's greater vision in that respect and for those kinds of things it's a lot easier for me to say no because they tend to be shorter bursts and um, don't require too much of my time and so if I don't connect with it then I don't really have to do it and I, f I feel like I've, I'm okay with that now. And I feel like I've really only learned to exercise that in the last year, because there was a, a point in time where I was very like, you should just do it, you should just do it. And, um, and I think that just comes from like this angst of like um, being a freelancer in the world, because there's this, there's this, for me anyway, there was this idea of like, if an opportunity comes, you better take it, because you don't know when the next one's coming. And like, you know, we all have overheads. So it's like, um, but I've learned, and I think I've been doing it for long enough that like I, I feel like I've found my flow and I feel like I've developed um, a network and I trust that like things will keep coming because they kind of always do. So when something comes that maybe that I don't align with or don't agree with, I'm a lot more comfortable with saying no. Because I have had those experiences of like saying yes and then like absolutely not vibing with it and then not enjoying my time on it and being made to feel like I'm in, li in a little bit of a, like a rock and a hard place. And the same for you two, yeah. Othello. How do I you learn when to say no? Like I'm not doing much at the moment commercial work, working people, but I've done some commercial work in, in terms of making work. But in terms of as, as the career is growing and my ideas become bigger and in studio cost, I have to think financially mm. and I have to financially plan, even though, you know, before I was a bit more um, loose on that side, I was just making the work and I was, but but now I have to think a bit more strategic because if you're going to keep on doing the project that I want to do and keep paying for the studio, I have to start thinking and I have to plan because realistically, those things are not going to be paid, paid for and I have to have money to make the work. So in terms like that, I've had to be think more strategically in terms of the financial side of being an artist um, if I want to keep doing the work that I'm doing and for the work to keep growing. But then, as you're an abstract expressionist, in terms of obviously so many other things but when it comes to your work specifically I know personally that that usually comes from emotion yeah. so when you have an industry or a commercial or a commission come up mm. how do you manage to externally create work knowing full well you're being paid for this 
so you have to produce this versus you're feeling something and you're then putting it on I the think canvas. it depends who you work for. So um, if I can talk about the one I did recently, which is a private commission, that was a bit different because there's lots of money and I did consider why I was taking this commission and it didn't like the, like one of my aesthetics that I normally use, I, I compromised on that. But then I had to think about how much that's gonna pay for the studio for how long. But then if you work with other places, like I worked with Autograph, I worked with Rene, it's much more, it's different when you work for like a public institution because it's much more of a conversation between you and the curator. So there's a lot more leeway for you to be more curative um, with the support of the, 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 the curator you're working with. So you, you can stretch your creativity as far as you want because that's why they approach you because they've trusted you and you've seen where your career has got to. So they wouldn't come to you before so they know that you, that you are an sort of established artist so they, there's, they, they, the expectation from you is a bit different. When you're working commercially, I'd say, um, like the one I did, there is a little bit of a leeway. I wouldn't normally do it, but then I had to, at this point, I had to think, well, yeah, like I said, it'll pay for the studio, it'll pay for me to make more work. I had to do a bit of compromising in that one. But even with that compromise, though, you then managed to evolve with your work, because exactly. regardless of black being your foundation, the same as mm. mine, Though you had to explore colour to some degree, yeah. it actually mm. evolved your work to another level that you could probably explore yeah, that you wouldn't have to Yeah, too far from the work, so exactly. I still kept the abstraction. I still had your signature regardless yeah. of it being mm. non-black anyway. Yeah. And the same for you, Josh, and then we'll conclude. <coughs> um, I think, it, I don't know, what, I, was, I was kind of thinking a bit back to like a question you asked before about um, like working with other people or working on like commissions from um, spaces that maybe you wouldn't normally f kind of function with. And I think like, I don't know, I guess that happened at the end of the year with the Sainsbury Center. It's like the family, the Sainsbury's <laughs> supermarket family, <laughs> they own like a, um, a huge space in, I think it's Norwich. Um, and I was asked by Howard Offer, who's a performance artist, um, like a queer black performance artist to make uh, do a performance or make a work for an event they were hosting during a exhibit on ancient egypt and it's a space that's full of like stolen artifacts from all over the world um and the exhibition on ancient egypt was like in the basement <laughs> so it was kind of sad um and harold decided to like take the commission and kind of like twist it in in favor of like afrofuturism rather than like focusing purely on like egypt as this kind of like token african uh, continent, uh, country that everyone kind of draws inspiration from. And for me, like, I couldn't be there physically because it was my cousin's wedding, but um, I made a video and then my reaction to that was kind of like, I trusted Harold and like the negotiations he'd made and the work that I created, I was basically, when I sent it to them, I was like, I don't know if you're gonna wanna play it, but this is what I've made. Because <clears throat> it wasn't explicit in um, like calling them out, but it was in an abstract kind of, loose-ish way it was like about like violence on like others other people and like specifically me like I that was supposed to be playing on the screen that fucked up in the end but like I made this video and then I was like this kind of like obviously black because it was me but like non-human potentially creature that exists in the world and I kind of wrote a poem about like the kind of like constant need to fulfill ourselves and like sustain ourselves even though the world is constantly decaying and kind of talking about like rich people continuously like trying to maintain their wealth. And then there was like scenes of me like hanging from a tree like from the leg, but like referencing a lot of like violence enacted upon bodies in order to kind of keep what is in the space, you know? So like I wanted them to play that like sound and that reflection while people were looking at the artifacts and kind of that phrase I was repeating, you stole my breath, which is like obviously kind of reference to George Floyd and kind of also reference to these artifacts which have been stolen and kind of like placed in a different context. Um, so yeah, I think my reaction to that was like making something that like maybe they don't want, but they've paid for it now. <laughs> <laughs> That's powerful though. Your ancestors would be proud. <laughs> but anyway, to conclude, thank you everyone for coming. Oh, we have a question. You're not shy anymore. Go on. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I think, thank you. Thank you for asking also. I think for me, like, yes and no. Like, because my background is communication, I was always kind of, especially with performance and especially with like a performance of action, like moisturizing or like polishing the shoe, it's like, we went through a long process of like, why would I choose this specific action? Like, what do I want the person coming in to kind of understand or see from this very like simple four hours thing? <laughs> so I think in that sense, it's like, I'm doing it because I want to do it. And it's something that's very personal to me, but at the same time, I want people to kind of like read signs. So for example, like the boot I used was like a Dr. Martin, which is obviously like an English thing, but it also kind of like, the laces I used were like specifically military because I was in the military for a few years and like polishing is like a practice that you would do there to kind of like make yourself uh, ready for display more or less, but also kind of referencing to like black people polishing shoes for money. So it had like, I was trying to find things which had many layers of meaning, but in one very simple like action. So I think in that sense that you have to think about what people are gonna see or understand, otherwise you're never gonna hit where you wanna hit. Um, and with other work similar, I guess, yeah, like this textile, like supposed to be looking as if it could fall at any moment, it's supposed to be uneasy, it's supposed to be a structure that's also like a non-structure that's moving. So I definitely think like, why would I show it in this way? Why does it hang in this way and then it's not flat on the floor? Like, for sure, yeah. yeah I think I like to use a bit of like symbolisms in the work sometimes. So, so there's little hints to what I'm trying to say in the work so that the audience can either pick up on it or draw their own sort of narratives or conclusions about the work. And I quite like that when the audience comes to the work and they see something different to me. But in terms of like thinking about the audience, it's really interesting that recently I get a lot of questions about that. People asking me, so who is the audience? Who would you, what sort of audience would like your work? But I'm getting that from externally from other people rather than from myself. And like, I don't, I think that's because if you're starting to think or going to the commercial arena, they kind of like ask that question to who, who is your audience or who do you see as your audience? Um, and I had to think about that a little bit, but that's not in terms of making the work, it's more them to trying to understand, I think commercially where your work is and where do you place your work. But that's not me, that's not me driving those questions. It's coming from questions from, say from gallerists and stuff, they're asking me those questions. But in terms of the work, it's, it's playing with symbolisms or maybe using a certain color and gets you to question um, why I've chosen that particular thing or why have I added that into the work and the little hints, but not giving too much away because I'm very much trying to minimalize how much I give away, but leaving enough to provoke a conversation. Um, I, I think for myself, um, I think just because of the context of like the medium that I work in, which is dance and performance and like theater and I have to consider that to a certain extent because um, in terms of live work anyway it's it's always quite long it's always quite a long piece so it's, I think like the shortest one we've ever done is like 45 minutes sometimes you're expecting an audience to sit with you for like an hour or more um, so I, I I think about it in terms of like once I've kind of gotten everything out and and poured all my ideas out and feel maybe a, a bit more affirmed in the concept and the themes that I'm using for this project, I do then have to kind of think about the audience when I'm thinking about my structure and the way that I piece it together. And also I feel like as a movement artist, like, but someone who creates, I choreograph, like what feels good to us as movers doesn't always like isn't always engaging for people looking at you um, because dance is an experience so I can really have fun and like be fulfilled in my movement for myself but it's not reading in the same way that it's feeling. Um, so I do have to question those things and um, I always ask myself like, um, what, not necessarily what would the audience think but if I was in your shoes, like would, what is gonna make me hang on to the next moment and what is gonna make me look forward to what's coming next and what's gonna maybe take me by surprise or, so I, I do think about the audience in that way, not so much in terms of like the substance that I wanna work with, but definitely like the way that it ebbs and flows and that's like for the sound design and the lights and the, um, cause especially with longer pieces like they can flatline and after 15, 20 minutes, it feels like 
you've seen everything that is to follow for the next 40. So it's like, how do you keep it um, moving in, almost like a movie, like you want it, it has to have a, a sense of a journey. So I do, I do think about that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And to conclude on that journey, thank you, Brian, for being the first invited curator to moderate the Antigen Conversation. And thank you all for being on the panel. If you want to see any of Joshua's work, you can also go to the second floor. And there are a few pieces that were at the Antigone Takeover that are there. But yeah, thank you guys and have a good night. Thank you.